At my stage in life, I have two very strong whys. I want to raise my four sons to be strong, capable, emotionally rounded young men. And at the same time, I have another why, and that is I want to support, develop and assist in co continuing these conversations about women in leadership. I really think there's a strong place in this society to have more female leaders, and we'll talk about, a little bit more about that today. Ed, I have 10 years experience as, in IT, in the financial services sector, and I then have another 11 to 12 years in the direct selling industry. In that time, I've seen good and bad management, I've seen good and bad leadership, and it's been delivered by male and female alike. And I myself have held many leadership roles in, in my time. It's in the latter half of my career that I've really seen the benefit of self-development, personal growth, empowerment, and, and the effects that can have on really encouraging people to step outside their comfort zones. And that's been in a stark contrast to the first 10 years of my life, where at one point I was told, men take charge, women take care. So, I think there's a conversation to be had here. If you think about the numbers here, research has shown that if you compare companies that have the highest percentage of female directors on their board, compared to those that don't, without any leaders, um, they out, the, first, the latter is outperformed by the former by a factor of 41%. Leeds, uh, Leeds University Business School, they'll tell you by simply having one female director on your board, you drop the, the chance of you going bust as a company by 20%. And yet, only 17% of the board of directors are women. It's not just in business as well. You think about it, the UN has recently produced a report that says if you include women in peace negotiations, that you will uh, increase the likelihood of the violence ending within 12 months by 24%. Sadly, only 4% of women are peace negotiators. Julia Batcher's own talk, TED talk on this is definitely worth a watch if you're interested in that. Also as well, we've got 190 heads of state, nine are women. We have of all the parliaments around the world, merely 13% representation. So, okay, is it simply a nice thing to talk about? Is it something we should do? Or is there a bit more behind it? Well, let's have a think. Um, McKinsey produced a report called Women Matter Too. And in that, they looked at the, how increasing the percentage of female leaders in an organization can actually give that company com a competitive edge. They looked at key leadership behaviors, and these are the behaviors they found to be the ones that really give a company uh, more productivity and more profitability. And these are people development, inspiration, role modeling, and expectation and reward. They then went on and they said, of men and women, how are these applied? Well, they, find, they found that actually more frequently and more effectively, women actually applied these four behaviors more than men. Uh, following on from that, they went and talked to a panel of CEOs and they said, what do you feel most are the leadership behaviors that most prepare your organization for the challenges of the future? Of the four they listed, three were already on our leadership behaviors list. Okay? When you uh, look at that, a recent report called The Power of Parity, this report says by shrinking the gender gap, we could worldwide, we can add $12 trillion to the annual GDP by 2025. That's big. Those numbers are big numbers. The Women and Work Commission here in the UK have said that simply by putting more emphasis on generating more women in leadership positions, that we per annum could put here in the UK an extra £23 billion into the exchequer. Those are a lot of numbers. There is a business case here. Okay, so this, it's not just a question of it being a nice thing to do. There is a business case here. There's profitability to be had for organizations. But let's have a think about how are female leaders um, perceived in society, okay? Sheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of Facebook, she will tell you that there is a positive correlation between men, success, and likability. Unfortunately, the same is not true of women. There's, there's a negative correlation between women, likability, and success. And this is backed up by the Harvard Business Review, who recently um, wrote a paper called The Unseen Barriers to Women in Leadership, where it said accomplished high potential women who are evaluated as competent managers often fail the likability test, and tend to this, uh, whereas competence and likability tend to go hand to hand for similarly, similarly accomplished men. We need to think about how the media, there's a lot of social discourse at the moment about how men and women are written about in the media. If you think about it, our, UK, our current UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, how many column inches have been dedicated to her appearance, her hairstyle, how she's looking, what shoes she's got on? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't remember much being written about David Cameron, whether he went for a single or double-breasted suit, whether it was Hugo Boss or Asda, and how it flattered his figure or not. 
One of my favorite ones is uh, Pia Sundhager, who is the coach of the Swedish women's football team, and she was interviewed by uh, a reporter who very foolishly asked her, Pia, do you think you've got the skill set to manage a men's team? And a rather succinct reply is, well, Angela Merkel runs a country, I think I can manage a team. So um, also as well, if we think about it, you know, we had the recent uh, Rio Olympics, and there was a big backlash on how the reporting was on the female athletes and their sporting successes. Uh, when you think about it, there's one instance where a husband was being accredited with the success of his, uh, of his wife, with, his, with her achievement, and there was more column inches dedicated to the cut of the female athlete rather than the colour of a medal, rather than her clothing. I think Simone Biles, a highly rep the highly accomplished American gymnast, well, she really nailed it. She was being interviewed by a journalist, and the journalist was trying to compare her successes with other male Olympians. And she said, I am not the next Usain Bolt, I am not the next Michael Phelps, I'm the first Simone Biles. And I think that's leadership there and then. That's teaching a whole new generation of female athletes that they don't need to measure their success by using a male, a male Olympian's success as comparison. A uh, rather tongue-in-cheek article that was written, I thought was quite funny, about um, Michael Phelps. And it described Michael as though he were a female athlete. And it said Michael was to be commended with how well that he had managed the needs of his newborn baby, his up-and-coming wedding preparations, and his very hectic training schedule. So it was quite tongue-in-cheek, but it, what it did was highlight a disparity in how men and women are reported on in the media. So. Uh, also, we need to cast my mind back, 1973, I don't know how many people in the room remember this, but there was a tennis match called the Battle of the Sexes. Uh, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. And this match came about because Bobby Riggs came out with the assumption, the claim, that women were, were less superior capable, uh, superiorly athletic than men. Now, the prize money was $100,000, but I think uh, Miss, uh, Miss King was very much aware of the fact that there was a lot more at stake, not just the paycheck, when she said, I thought it would set us back 50 years if I didn't win that match. It would affect all women's self-esteem. Needless to say, Miss King went on to win that match. So, if we'll have a think about what other contributing factors are here. From my own past experience, I've really found that women feel they don't deserve the success. They're not worthy of the success. Sometimes they doubt, are they capable? Uh, so many times I've seen women attribute their success to luck, being at the right place at the right time, or as a byproduct of something else. Also, as well, women are far too adept at putting other people's needs in front of theirs. They have their own needs, and then, top of that, then in front of that become the family, the other half, the job, the husband. And all in this time in doing this, these needs here, our needs, what we're saying is these have no value because they're further and further down the priority list. And in saying, that if I don't value my needs, how can I expect someone else to value them at the same time? And by, also by association, my contribution. Um, in 2012, I was asked to present at a leadership conference. I had to write and present a workshop which talked about how increased self-confidence can really help you achieve your own personal goals. I was absolutely amazed by the uptake of this conference, of this workshop. We had to move the room three times to accommodate the amount of people that wanted it. And it was 100% women who attended this. It was frightening how women's lack of self-belief had really become self-limiting. Okay, moving on. My brother sent me an email a while ago, and it said in that email there was a fabulous poem by Marianne Richardson. And I think this has been to my wall at work, and I think we could all could be reminded of this every now and again. It's a very strong message. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deeper, deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are we not to be? So my talk today is what I want to do is I want to urge everyone in this room, men and women alike, to think how can we develop these conversations about women in leadership? The thing that annoys me most, I would say, is the language that we use. It's the language we use and how we apply it to men and women, boys and girls. How many of you have seen this one before? How many girls have been described, women have been described as bossy, but in a man that are considered leadership skills? How many women in the room have uh, referred to themselves as a working mum, or heard the term being used as a working mum? How many working dads are in the room? We don't tend to measure a man's contribution by whether or not he is a family, so let's not apply the same logic to women. Um, there was a recent um, piece of work that was done where uh, two case studies were written, 
and they're written specifically for this. And the case studies, they were exactly the same, but they were given to two separate groups, and the only thing that was different was the name of the leader involved. In one instance, Melanie was the leader, and in exactly the same case study, Frank was the leader. And these were given to two groups, and these groups were asked to assess the leaders on their behaviors their, and their skills. What happened was, in a situation, a team um, meeting situation, Melanie was deemed manipulative, but the language used to describe Frank was shrewd. Uh, in a situation where everybody was contributing ideas, Melanie was deemed a little bit too feisty in this instance, where Frank was enthusiastic. There was an error made on the part of the leader. Melanie was described as an airhead, a bit ditzy. Frank was dis forgetful and just a little bit distracted. Last but by no means least, there was one situation which was a, a situation of conflict, and in her handling of it, Melanie was deemed abrasive, where Frank was merely a little bit annoying. So here we're seeing a disparity. We're seeing double standards with the language we use. I can point out as well that women and men assessed both Melanie and Frank, so they're both involved, and women assessed for Melanie as harshly as the men did. So we need to be aware of the language that we use. We need to be aware of the impact it has. Why is it that we tell boys, young boys, to grow up here, man up? We tell, um, we tell them, well, you're acting like a big girl's blouse. When we say to, to young girls, the girls that jump in puddles and climb trees, and we call them a tomboy, we say, you're fast for a girl, you're strong for a girl. I think we need to be very conscious of the impact it has and the gender bias that we are beginning to instill in the next generation. One of the most the greatest words I think abused at the moment is the word feminism. Feminism seems to have morphed somewhat in the last few years, and it's up there with fascist and racist. racist. So feminist, fascist, racist, they're all there, very militant and very poorly perceived. The feminism is all about equality between men and women. It's all about equal contribution by men and women to society. It's both of them drawing back down from society equally as well. So it's all about equality, and that is what my talk is about here today. Leadership and management are two very different things, in my humble opinion. Management is when a manager gives you, the worker, a set of tools, a set of resources, a timetable, and says, off you go down that road there. That's where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. Report back every now and again, let me know how you get on. A leader is the one who goes there first and says, come on, I've been here. I know what this is like. I can show you how to get there. That's the inherent difference between leadership and management. We have so many role models of good leadership, of people who went there first. We have Amelia Earhart, Florence Nightingale, Marie Stopes, who was a UK scientist in the early 20th century and was lauded for her work on contraception and sex education. Margaret uh, Hamilton, whose code put Apollo, the first Apollo on the moon. Amelia, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, and Rosa Parks, the little girl who wouldn't get off the bus. We've got modern-day role models as well. Michelle Obama, we've got um, Angela Merkel, Sheryl Sandberg, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. We have Malala Yousafzai, the youngest ever to receive the, theme, the, 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 pardon me, the Nobel Peace Prize for her work on women and, and girls in, educa in education, and J.K. Rowling. We have people here from science, from medicine, from philanthropy, from the arts, who are leaders and who are, have gone there first and are showing us the way. Do any of you recognize the names Madame Clicquot and Madame Bollinger? These ladies in the 19th and 20th century built champagne empires at a time when women were hardly, hardly the captains of industry, and they did that with hard work, determination, and a real passion for what they did. When we think about the skill set of, of, of what a good leader would look like, if I were to tell you, uh, describe to you somebody who had great project management skills, conflict resolution, who's great at scheduling and great at building relationships, who would that person be? We need to have role models around us that we can say and look to and they can inspire us and more local to home. Well, if I told you that you have potentially had somebody very close to home who had that skill set, would you look at them as a role model? What if I told you that these were skills that were used by your own mother? One, two, or all of these in probably bringing you up. I can tell you I've used many of these. Conflict resolution in particular is a great one when looking after my four boys. And it's a skill I've then transferred to many business meetings, I can tell you. So in conclusion, what can we do? Leadership is a skill like any other. We have, can learn it, it can be taught. We're not going to change the perception of people overnight and how women are perceived. 
We're not going to simply install a software update, and that's the, our language changed. We all have an opportunity to make a change here. And when you think about it, we often say, you know, it's society. Society has to change. Well, who are society? You, 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 me. We're all society. We are all there. So it is up to us to make a change. How do we see the future? How do we see um, a society in ha where uh, all of us are concerned? Okay? The whole topic of equality is a very, very broad one, and I know I'm only covering a very small, specific part of it here. And this is the part I'm interested in, which is women in leadership. I think that we can really, really reap a reward here by actively encouraging more women into leadership positions. I know what I want to do. I want to be involved in mentoring and coaching. I want to be involved in inspiring. I want to work with organizations and companies. I want to work with communities. Because we can all contribute and make a difference. So what I ask you guys is, have you seen somebody in your life, a coworker, a friend, your mother, your sister, you thought, she's got leadership potential? Could you mentor them yourself? Do you know of somebody who can? Perhaps you're sitting there thinking, hmm, I actually have leadership aspirations myself, and am I letting my own self-beliefs become self-limiting? When we hear people using gender-biased language, language that deprecates the contribution of women to society and to the workplace, are we prepared to call people out? I mentioned at the start that I have two whys, raising my sons to be well-rounded young men, and at the same time working on my passion for women in leader, more women in leadership. Some may look at them and go, they're quite disparate. I don't think so. I think by working to help and support more women into leadership roles, that I am hoping to inspire the next generation to strive further, jump higher, reach beyond. And in doing that, these are the co-workers, these are the friends and the potential partners, my children. Also at the same time, by working with, uh, by trying to raise my sons, I hope they can look to me one day as a role model and think that it's okay for a woman to be strong and independent and capable and ambitious. So I'm going to leave you with one final thought. I think the time has come that we need to step up and accept these challenges that present us with regards to putting more women into leadership positions. We need to step out from under any perceived glass ceiling. We need to step out of our comfort zones. And I really think the time has come now for a step change into a new era of management. Thank you for your time. <laughs>